But the moment the giving concretion is dispersed, the elements which were parts of it stand alone, and no one of them implies that whole any longer, or implies any of the other parts, either the three angles separately, nor one or the other of the sides implies any triangle. Each element is now a complete essence, open to separate intuition, and not manifesting any need or proclivity to be united with any other essences into a whole centered elsewhere. Nor does it ask to be elaborated inwardly into any one of those patterns which might be introduced into it without destroying its outline and its present definition. Any such elaboration, if by chance it grows manifest, sets a new total essence before intuition, and abolishes the former object in its specious simplicity. For the outline preserved in the more complex essence being but an outline there is not the same actual object as the similar outline given pure and apart, though discourse may substitute the one for the other at its own convenience. Thus logical implication is unilateral. Every essence involves its parts, considered as the elements which integrate it. But these elements, considered as separate essences and individual units, which all essences are, do not in turn imply any whole into which they may enter elsewhere. For they may enter into all sorts of concretions, and their only essential being is their own, and what is intrinsic to their individuality. Logical implication interests the contemplative mind because it enriches intuition. But the only implications that concern discourse are transitive and therefore borrowed from the flux of nature. Wherever there is growth towards maturity or through some biological cycle, an eye familiar with that round may see in the earlier phases a promise of a later the grub, for the naturalist, prophesies the butterfly, although presumably the essence of the butterfly is totally absent from the aspect of the grub and from its mind. There is only, I suppose, a mechanism which eventually brings about that complete transformation but without needing to trace this substantial continuity. The naturalist may observe the gross phases and outer habits of nature as it forms bread one another directly, and this regularity in phenomena may become for him a sort of implication, as the flight of birds became an omen to the attentive augurs. In an empirical system, causation is reduced to superstition, skipping from fact to observe fact without attempting to penetrate any of them or to examine the medium which connects them substantially. It attributes to a juxtaposition of appearances a mysterious power to reproduce itself. Unfortunately, in immediate experience there are, strictly speaking, no repetitions. The word and occurs often, but never for actual feeling in exactly the same context or with exactly the same emphasis and color. Empirical philosophy, if sincere, ought to become mystical and to deny that the flux of events has any articulation or method in it. The fertility of being would then be devoid of all implication. No involution would justify evolution or give it direction. Even pictorial physics, however, may discover in the flux of things something besides continuity. There is inheritance. A son may not only appear as if by chance in his father's family, 
but he may have his father's nose. So in any moral heritage, there is a survival of early features in the midst of accretion and change. The Old Testament is not merely bound among us in the same volume with the new, but the new quotes the old, and the old is said to prophesy the new. In asking any question, we demand a relevant answer. The missing feature must not only come into a given field, but must somehow fit into it essentially. A satisfying answer, while certainly not implied in the question, responds to the essence of that question in a way predetermined within logical limits. It is pertinent. Pertinence is a loose or partial implication, as inheritance is a loose and partial repetition. When these are added to continuity, we have perhaps as much logical coherence before us as can be demanded of phenomena. I have said that logical implication is explicit inclusion of a part in a whole, but what is inclusion? When one essence is said to include another, an identification has taken place in discourse between an element in the inclusive essence and the whole of the included one but no essence can be another so that in this identification which is the first principle and condition of reasoning there is something non-logical not to say absurd we may say and must say if we discourse on the subject at all that pure being includes unity and that unity includes pure being Yet if pure being were a part of unity, unity would not be one. And if unity were a part of pure being, pure being would not be pure. It is language and thought that create this confusion by giving the same names, being or unity. To essences not in themselves identical. Because the being included in unity is not the individual essence of pure being. The nature of essence is pluralistic and excludes pantheism. So the unity included in pure being is not the individual essence of unity, but an inseparable, pervasive, and unique something found in pure being by human intuition, identified abusively, but inevitably, with the essence of unity when inspected apart. Identification is approximate only, and therefore inclusion is fictitious. Not that identification need be erroneous, as if, for instance, the unity in pure being were not truly unity but plurality. Unity is the right name for it. The essence of unity as contemplated separately is the right one to assimilate to pure being since in discourse assimilations are inevitable. But the point is that the most proper identification is still the act of calling one essences which are individually two, a trick of discourse and language. Thus pure being is truly included in light as in all essences and may be discerned by intense attention in the given essence of light. But light is nevertheless not compounded of pure being, present also to mere wakefulness in the dark. And the second factor, light without being. The second factor, whatever else it was, would include pure being as much as the supposed compound includes it. Predication is therefore not a discovery of composition. As a thing is not a compound of its appearances, so an essence is not a compound of the terms into which it may be analyzed. Analysis yields something specifically different from the object that justifies the analysis. Thus, pure being is truly included in light, as in all essences, and may be discerned by intense attention in the given essence of light. But light is nevertheless not compounded of pure being present also to mere wakefulness in the dark. And a second factor, 
flight without being. The second factor, whatever else it was, would include pure being as much as the supposed compound includes it. Predication is therefore not a discovery of composition, as a thing is not a compound of its appearances, so an essence is not a compound of the terms into which it may be analyzed. Analysis yields something specifically different from the object that justifies the analysis. An essence never is any description of it. Essences have no origin, and in that sense no constituents. Their elements are only their essential features, which define them and are defined by them. A straight line may be intuited alone, say by an organic motor impulse felt in a dream. You traverse it, you have an immediate acquaintance with its absolute nature. You may think that you find it again by inspecting the edges of a triangle, but here the object, straight line, has become the object of a different sense. Sight, and appears in a context, the visible triangle, absent before, and strictly excluded by the original intuition expressing only a motor impulse within the organism. The identification of the straight line there with the straight lines here is therefore intentional only, not actual. It expresses an affinity between the two intuitions, their partial equivalence in discourse, and perhaps the separate occurrence of the first may have contributed through the preparation and enrichment of the psyche to the present complexity of the second. Such conventional dialectic in which intuition is submerged in the rush of animal discourse is facilitated by words and other rude symbols. Human intelligence is strangely materialistic, not in respect of matter where materialism would be in place, but in logic. It begs of science, which it assumes to remain materially identical, to assume it of the identity of the essences signified. Whenever we use the same word, we suppose ourselves to have the same idea, and in any long or accurate argument, direct intuition must give place to guidance by a conventional notation. Discourse becomes a sort of calculating machine by which material counters are shuffled materially, and intuition is only required, if at all, to read off the result attained mechanically. Demonstration at best is something verbal and technical. Logic is a kind of rhetoric. It marshals intuitions in ways which are irrelevant to them. In time, in the order of complexity, by analysis or by synthesis, so it considers terms only from the outside, as if in the end everything did not hang on what they are intrinsically. Color, for instance, being revealed by the same sense that simultaneously reveals extension, is felt to be inseparable from it, or even from the material object believed to exist in three dimensions. Yet color in itself is a most pungent and positive essence, which can come and go while extension remains the same, and it is only an accident of human sensibility that no organ yields something which might be called color without extension. As the ear yields high notes comparable to violet and low notes comparable to deep red, if this analogy were felt a little more strongly, everyone might indulge in the license of symbolistic poets who tell us that treble is azure and bass is crimson. They are only letting the cat out of the bag and betraying the secret that all identifications are matters of discursive impulse, intentional and poetical. Nothing is anything else. All essences, however complex, are individuals, and they are individuals, however simple. 
their parts are parts only of that whole as the right half of a picture is to the right and is a half only when the whole is given with it otherwise it makes a whole picture by itself and its center is in the middle of it not at the left hand edge but the simplicity of intuition makes the knowing mind impatient it must get on even if it gets into trouble it loves generalities but generality is a property only of animal attitudes or of names in respect to the range of their application many persons may be called john many essences may be called triangles including the various definitions of the triangle itself but this is not a generality but an individual essence which is or might be discovered separately it is not likely that the same essence should ever appear twice in human experience of course any essence may reappear since it is a universal but the complexity and fluidity of life make exact repetitions unlikely in actual intuition the essences about which discourse hovers and to which it repeatedly refers are objects of intent just as things are there are common goals and miscellaneous vital approaches and if an intuition of them were ever attained intent and animal faith would still be requisite in order to identify the object present at the end with the object intended at the beginning the realm of essence then while it is infinite continuous and compact nevertheless leaves each of its elements entirely alone and self-centered it is the home of indelible multiplicity and eternal individuality no essence not even pure being has any moral prerogative or any cosmic influence by virtue of its essential being. Those functions belong to contingent existences by virtue of their dynamic relations with one another, which traverse and underlie the varying forms which they wear. Poetry and music lie as deep in the realm of essence as any logic. The thread of humor runs through it as essentially as that of fate, Pure sense has no object but essence. Every contravention of human logic or natural law, as by chance established, is as firmly rooted in that laughing firmament as are Euclid and the Ten Commandments. A mock solemnity has too long made humanity pose as absolute. Its virtues would be safer and more amiable if they recognize their relativity and the spirit will be freer to recognize its superhuman affinities because there is no reason why spirit should be merely human in its interest even nature likes to slip the gossamer bonds of human propriety and expectation which entangle the fancy only of special individuals or nations for matter resembles a lady often divorced, though never without a husband. The realm of essence is the playground of an even greater freedom, and a far more real singleness and integrity of being, because it justifies and exemplifies constancy no less than variety. Variability is hardly freedom, since it undermines the soul which aspires to be free. The desire to break away from an established system of life is, after all, a sign of weakness. A man has failed to become willingly and perfectly what he was attempting to become blindly. The truly radical liberty which the realm of essence opens before us is liberty to be something positive, as positive, precise, elaborate, and organic as it is in us to make it. Essence is an eternal invitation to take form and the virtue of this invitation is not exhausted by being once accepted. All the possibilities remain always open ideally, and when the earth of a particular world quakes under it, and it fears to be lost forever, its own essence, among the essences of all the other worlds, stands by in an ironical eternity. 
waiting for it to dissolve and perhaps to be born again. Note. In this discussion, I have endeavored to keep my eye on the living subject matter and to make my language as plastic as possible in the description of it. But there are learned men whose notion of clearness is always to use words as they have been used before. They may find my view confused and may ask indignantly whether I am a realist, a conceptualist, or a nominalist. Let me observe in the first place that even among the scholastics, these positions were held exclusively only by partisans and heretics. The orthodox doctrine included and required the three views in their respective places. Universals lay in the mind of God before the creation and guided it. They therefore were ante rum. But according to classical natural history and morals, all created beings were inwardly addressed to determinate types, so that perfection and depravity were possible, and souls could be saved or lost. The universals lay therefore in re, and were the souls of things. Finally, human observation might gradually discover and define these universals by giving a common name to their various instances as they appeared, for example, in disease or in beauty. Universals for human experience were therefore post-rem. We move now the Platonic ideas in their moral exclusiveness and substitute an infinite realm of essence. All universals will still be prior to existence. All possible natural types classes, or ideals, will be found among them, as well as repeated in the pattern of nature, and every concept of thought, as well as every image and sense, will be found there also, and will be a universal. Universals are individual, not general. Terms can be general only in use, never intrinsically but the individual is an essence, not an existing particular. The latter is not a possible object of intuition and has no place in logic. It is some fragment of the flux of nature, posited in action, and by virtue of that status for ever external to thought. My position, then, is simply the orthodox, scholastic one in respect to pure logic, but freed from platonic cosmology and from any tendency to psychologism. The Basis of Dialectic If essences have no external relations and therefore no implications, what can be the source of dialectic? When a man is inconsistent, we seem to distinguish that which should follow logically in his thought or action from that which ensues actually. And whence that systematic extension of concepts, so vast in scope and so specific, which the mathematician pursues, and which leads him sometimes to revolutionary discoveries, whence that pregnancy in ideas, political or theological, which often renders them ominous, secretly absurd, and as it were, hypocritical, having at heart implications which on the surface they disown. The very notion of pregnancy gives, I think, a hint of the answer. Pregnancy belongs to matter, not to essence. The difference between what follows logically and what follows actually cannot be due to the conflict of two different orders of existence, one logical and the other natural. An existing logical order would be something metaphysical, monster half essence and half force the difference must be due rather to two levels of natural organization one cosmic and inanimate the other animate and proper to the innate involution of the psyche in man which opens to his imagination and reason paths other than those actually traced by outer nature even in his own action or explicit discourse 
in the realm of essence, if ever we shake ourselves loose from our animal distractions and presumptions, everything that appears at all appears patently, but in reasoning there is initially a hidden affinity or tendency in the terms, which does not become patent until the conclusion is reached. Then indeed the implication of those terms in this conclusion becomes clear because they now simply define a new essence to which they are intrinsic. This new essence I know by intuition. No dialectic is involved in seeing or defining it to be thus. When the number two is given in intuition, the number one, repeated, is involved in it. This repetition of one is the very essence in view. But. When the number one is given first, it is an accident whether I begin to count and whether I go on living until I reach the notion of two. Therefore, it is possible for me to define or deduce the number one by analysis when I have the number two, but not possible to define two when I have only one. On the other hand, it is quite possible by living to climb to the notion of two from that of one, but impossible to climb to one from two, because one is then already in my possession and under my foot. I may observe in passing, confirming what I have said above about pure being, that dialecticians who find in one the root of all numbers, or in the one, the fountain of the universe, seem to be at heart less lovers of essence than of substance. They are not intent on form, or are searching for ultimate elements in the depths of time or of evolution, or something materially radical and indestructible in this existing world. High numbers do not satisfy them, and seem to them secondary as they seem unreal or even humorous to idle human fancy. Yet in the realm of essence, all numbers are equally primitive and equally in the foreground. The parity and eternity of all essences has hardly dawned on the minds of philosophers, at least not in the West. Dialectic evidently involves transition. It is progressive, but any actual transition transcends the realm of essence where every term traversed must always retain its intrinsic character and proves that an existential and moving factor is at work, namely, attention, and whatever may be the basis or organ of attention and of its movement. In a word, a psyche is involved, which herself involves, as we shall see, an existing material world, but dialectic contains more than transition, since this transition is often assumed to be a reversion. In reasoning, intent continually harks back to the object of a previous intuition and compares it with that of the present one. This feat is materially impossible, but it suffices if we perform it presumptively by assuming that our successive objects are identical and that we should find them to be so if it were possible for us to observe them simultaneously. To transition, then, reasoning professes to add repetition and assurance of repetition, so that besides a series of intuitions, we must admit a power in thought which is not intuition but intent. Since its object is something not given, but posited at a distance and identified in character only, not in position, but the given term, Intent is a sort of projection through faith, positing a relation of which only one term is given. The terminus, or point of origin here, together with a gesture, word, or a sense of direction indicating what and where the other term ought to be. This assumption, logically entirely in the air, is necessary to establish any instance of cogency contradiction, or fallacy in reasoning. 
for the obvious disparity of two terms given simultaneously, whence comes all the emotional and essential assurance that the square is not round, does not prove any contradiction in discourse until we assume that these very essences were present to some mind professing to identify them, and this assumption is very likely to be false and is always hazardous. Is the great source of futility in argument. The first postulates of dialectic, therefore, the constant meaning of terms and the principle of contradiction are rooted in animal faith. The light of intuition cannot avail to establish that use of them which alone renders them potent in discourse or applicable to any subject of ulterior interest. The obvious is obvious, but terminates in itself, that which we say must be so, need not be so, unless our habits of inference are independently justified by the course of nature. Now that part of nature which is the organ of mind, the psyche, is a relatively closed system of movements, and hereditary. The living seed, as it matures, puts forth predeterminate organs and imposes specific actions and feelings on the young creature. He must eat, fall in love, build a nest, resent interference or injury, but this predetermination is not exact, only generic. The seed develops as it can, under fire of the environment. The psyche in each individual grows into a somewhat different system of organs and habits, and these vary with time not merely according to the predetermined sequence of phases in the race, but according to the fortunes of the individual. This partial predetermination of life, which in man is especially imperfect and dependent on the chances of education and experience, is the source of the generic, the general, absent from the realm of essence, is omnipresent in impulse and action. Every living creature aims at and needs something generic, not anything in particular. Some food, some shelter, some mate, some offspring, some country, some religion. The impetuous soul, half-baked and addressed only to the generic, pounces on what it happens to find. It receives it into the stomach or into the mind and digests it if it can but there remains almost always a distinct disparity between hereditary capacities and demands and their potent vagueness and the satisfaction provided for them. Not this, not all of this, not merely this, says the psyche at every turn, and her sustenance leaves her half disgusted and half hungry. Experience at the same time clarifies the instincts which it disappoints and it is in terms of actual perceptions expurgated or transformed that secret ideals can first come to expression. Dialectic is fledged in this nest and obeys the same conjoined forces of innate impulse and causal experience. Each thought in its existence is due equally to the predisposition of the psyche and to the course of nature outside. But the presumptions inherent in the thought were accompanying and flowing out of it are determined by the psyche alone, by the momentum and direction of her life at that moment. Hence the whole moral conflict and tragedy between reason and fact, desire and event, the ideal and the actual, nature according to philosophers and nature according to nature. In pure reasoning, this conflict takes the form of opposing relevance, consistency, and implication to wandering thoughts or chance perceptions. But the force of logic, as we have amply seen, does not reside in the essences actually inspected which have no transitive relations, but expresses the habit and range of the psyche in the thinking animal. A mind not buffeted by change, 
in a world in which rain and shine are not alternate, you never think of any compliments to a present object. It might even passionately deny their essential reality. You might call China impossible, life in the water unthinkable, and any morality but the familiar one self-destructive. In minds as in insects, the vehemence of littleness is remarkable. Man, although born plastic and immature, soon borrows fixed prejudices from causal experience. He is teachable and achieves littleness or has it thrust upon him by custom and dogma. Acquaintance with facts and with how many facts is any man acquainted narrows his generic native demands into specific requirements. He must now have only this food, this shelter, this mate, these children, this country, this religion. In the same way, the mind, when indoctrinated, will suffer only this visit and only this logic. Nevertheless, any given world or any given flow of imagination is an accident. Its very character would be inexpressible were it not surrounded in the realm of essence with an infinitude of variations, any one of which, had it been realized instead, would have been equally accidental. Even the true sage who passes through the school of experience and learning only to recover his spiritual freedom cannot range impartially over the realm of essence. The paths he traces in that labyrinth are imposed on him by accident because a psyche is at work within him obeying special instincts and biased by a special experience. Even in him, the transitions of dialectic and the course of contemplation are not determined by the structure of the realm of essence, since the realm of essence by definition is the home of all possible structures. Dialectic then, while ostensibly following ideal implications absolved from any allegiance to facts or to actual instances of reasoning, secretly expresses a material life, and this in two stages. The psyche is predetermined at birth to certain generic conceptions and transitions, and these are rendered precise and irrecoverable by habits formed under the pressure of circumstances. Everything in dialectic hangs upon strength of soul. It is an effort to carry over intuition from one moment to another, to be true to oneself and to wander into no vision not congruous with one's first insight and complementary to it, so that at the end the mind may believe that it has gathered in and preserved all its riches and unearthed the secret of all its objects. This is something which no living mind does or can do, and in so far as the ambition to do it is successful, the success is balanced by a great illusion, almost inevitable to the complete logician. The unity which his discourse has achieved he imposes on the realm of essence and on the existing world as if it drew their circumference and repeated their intrinsic order. This illusion does not destroy the dialectical coherence of the system which occasions it, but the philosopher probably aspires to describe the truth, and in that he fails, in proportion to the vehemence with which he posits his system, with its dialectical structure in lieu of essence in its infinity and nature in her unknown depths. Dialectic is the conscience of discourse and has the same function as morality elsewhere, namely to endow the soul with integrity and to perfect it into a monument to its own radical impulse. But as virtue is a wider thing than morality, because it includes natural gifts and genial sympathies, or even heroic sacrifices, so wisdom is a wider thing than logic. 
to coherence in thought it adds docility to facts and humility even of intellect so that the integrity of its system becomes a human virtue like the perfect use of a single language without being an insult to the nature of things or a learned madness being a priori that is being the assertion in the face of things of a preformation in the soul dialectic is fundamentally romantic but its romanticism may become austere and ascetic in so far as it desists from professing to drag the world with it in its speculative flight how far the a priori rules in the mind is a biological accident you may imagine some insect or some angel created full-fledged in whom it should rule exclusively and we might perhaps find fanatics in whom it rules exclusively in speculative matters once they have been thoroughly indoctrinated for we must not suppose that anything is a priori in origin every instinct and organ has its history just as every custom has but once the organ formed it imposes a priori certain responses on the body and certain ideas on the mind the a priori is such only in function so when an intuition has become dominant it has established its subtle affinities in a well-organized mind the further march of mundane experience becomes useless to the logician or even distracting as young poets on a slender experience sometimes reach the greatest heights and the greatest depths finding nothing to intercept the impetuous flight of their spirits so the dialectician who most resolutely hedges in his thought in one lane of logic may go farthest in that direction and most unerringly he unveils some integral pattern perhaps never copied by things in the realm of essence the integrity of his pure intent and undivided attention have enabled him to unveil it he has laid on himself the difficult task of being consistent of being loyal not to the realm of essence which cannot be betrayed but to his own commitments he is determined to find and clarify the meaning of his spoken thoughts dangers lie to the right and left on his path he may slip into a change in his premises or into forgetfulness of his goal fulfillment is moral even in logic the mind bears burdens no less than the body from which indeed the mind borrows them and the pregnancy and implication of ideas are signs of that vital bias intuitions are themselves incidental to animal life in revealing the purest essence like a color or a number they remain rooted in the soil and render every image symbolic of the conditions under which it arises thus color brings with it extension form position and aerial emotional redolence drawn from the vital influence of light and room upon the psyche number suggests a certain particularity in its units as if it were a mere aggregate yet this particularity is proper only to the moments or parts of existence and is absent from the constituents of number in its purity for in number the logical units numbered are merely fractions of that number not particulars in themselves yet these physical roots of intuition are far from jeopardizing the essential purity of the flower to which they lend these human affinities horticulture simply becomes more varied and expression richer intuition lyrically marks the chief crises in material life and some organ composes and accelerates its movement turning it into a musical note dialectic 
is merely a change of scope in this organic synthesis by which a new essence is substituted for the one first given, that is, for the theme and terms of analysis or deduction. A change by which the original essence in disappearing is identified with a part of the new one or with a whole of which the new one is a part. Transitions are discursive, their necessity is merely psychical, but they lead to intuitions in which essences appear having intrinsically a logical complexity corresponding more or less perfectly to the stages of discourse which preceded. This correspondence, so far as it goes, makes the validity of dialectic a validity which cannot be intrinsic to the essence reached in the conclusion, since it is the validity of a process of a series of substitutions and identifications. Essences are related to dialectic somewhat as things are related to experience, as a stock or stone dead in itself may exercise a living influence on the imagination. If I strike it, or if it falls upon me, or if I take shelter beside it, I encounter a reality unfathomable in its complexity and pre-established in its station. But in my romantic experience, it has become an enemy or a friend. So the terms of discourse taken in themselves are passive and complete, implying no development, but I have arrived at them by the quick exercise of my senses or by a concretion of elements in my thought. There is a history and a momentum in my apprehension of them, and it is by no means indifferent to me, as it is to them, how they shall be superseded or transformed. Most sequels open in the realm of essence, and these sequels are infinite. Or even most sequels likely in a dream would prove irrelevant to the interest dominating waking discourse, which is not these pure appearances, but some problem in the material or moral world. Discourse is not contemplation, Dialectic is more laboriously intertwined with the accidents of existence than is intuition. It is selective, responsible, perilous, like everything in flux. It moves forward by a kind of treachery to its parent world and subtly pretends to fulfill that which it is destroying. The continuity is physical, not logical. The navigators who in the age of discovery followed in one another's traces or sought to outdo one another's exploits had a common background and a common field, otherwise their new worlds, however marvelous, would have added nothing to the old world and would not have discovered one another. America, China, and India would have retained their ancient self-sufficiency, while Castile and Aragon, England and Holland would have grown no richer and no wiser. So with every problem, however ethereal. The problem is a natural predicament, a living perplexity, limiting the relevance of the solution sought and creating its value. Discourse would not be cumulative. It would set and solve no problems if it did not share and express the adventures of a psyche in a material world. For the controlling force in reasoning is not reason, but instinct and circumstance. Opening up some path for the mind and pledging it to some limited issue. Dialectic, like investigation, is a path to an end. Is instrumental. When successful and finished, it yields to intuition, for which the facts and relations discovered become an ordered system, a single complex essence. Then the predicament and the problem lose their malignity. 
they survive only in the interest or beauty which, in dying, they bequeath to the new object spread before the mind. Contemplation becomes disinterested, but remains pleasant, for it is not the contemplation of any essences at random, but of those precisely to which a vital affinity drew the current of my blood, the hidden essences to which my nature was directed, partly from birth, partly by ingrained habit and arts learned by experience. It is the consecutive sanity and moral integrity of a mind that hold it down to dialectical consistency. There are goals in animal thought as in animal action and passion, of which thought in its material basis is indeed an integral part. These goals are set by the nature of the organs at work, a nature in its turn more or less adapted to its external opportunities so that the goals of a healthy intellect, for instance, geographical knowledge, like those of hunger or love, are not unattainable except by misadventure. When a geometer analyzes the triangle or a lawyer points out the implications of an alleged fact, he is appealing to a fund of principles domesticated in the minds of his hearers, principles which he may call axioms or simply common sense. His dialectic will be cogent if it leads, in the end, to an intuition in which all the details gathered during the argument may find their places. That is, although the successive intuitions and the essences they reveal will have disappeared, the stimulus and momentum which created them will proceed synthetically to a fresh intuition as it were their joint air, combining them without loss or friction. This total intuition will perfect the operation of its organ, raising rational life at that point to its natural entelechy. The many bypaths of fancy or logic, either not traced or explicitly excluded, will be called false or irrelevant and so they will be in this final system to which they are logically repugnant. But they cannot be false or irrelevant in themselves, nor in such other systems as they might help to build up. These other systems are rejected not by logic, but by the structure of the psyche and of her environment. Thus, Euclid clarifies the intuition of space, which the Egyptian builders, and earlier perhaps, and earlier perhaps their arboreal ancestors had gathered in the prosperous course of their sports. Euclid brings to light the real implications of such building and such swinging. His science guides those early arts to their ultimate self-knowledge. That those first terms of animal observation and this ultimate geometry are alike well chosen is a truth of physics and morals. Their application is perfect in the fields from which they were drawn. They give the true rationale of human building and swinging. But the realm of essence cannot suffer violence, and the constructions favored by man or by nature do not prevent the same elements from entering, if occasion arises, into other designs. The purely logical cogency of a system lies accordingly in the internal relations of that system when completed. The included elements have no intrinsic obligation to belong to such a system, but if they fall within the intuition of a living mind, which, if well knit, can have only one such ulterior system for its natural goal, they should be, and probably will be, addressed by that mind to that system. Were the elements left detached or combined into other wholes, dialectic proper to that mind would be lost in the sands of a vain experience, and its congenial system would never take shape. If, for instance, any other man had undertaken to compose this book, it is certain that at every crossroad in the argument he would have taken a term somewhat different from mine, without necessarily doing more violence to the elements combined. Our systems might have been equally coherent, 
if in each case the elements became parts of a single essence, clearly intuited, but each system would have been a monument to a different spirit and a different life. The value of two such logical systems for the description of nature would be a second and distinct question. The more cogent system might easily be the more extravagant or childish one if the elements combined were few or fantastic, or the harmony sought merely poetical. On each animal species, on each man and nation, nature imposes a special way of thinking, and they would be foolish to quarrel with their endowment. They will not attain truth or anything else by eluding it. Their thought will issue in a coherent system if their original intuitions were sharp, the synthesis of them broad, and the interpretation honest. Then all random trains of thought inconsistent with that system will be instinctively discarded, and through many a counsel in controversy, as in the formation of Christian dogma, heresies will be excluded as they suggest themselves, and the scattered original revelations will be interpreted in such a sense that the spirit which originally received them may honor them together. Every science and language and religion is big with unsuspected harmonies. It is for the genuine poet or philosopher to feel and to express them. Only an orthodoxy can possibly be right as against the bevy of its heresies, which represent wayward exclusions or a fundamental disloyalty. But no orthodoxy is right as against another orthodoxy. If this expresses an equal sensitiveness to the facts within its purview and equal intellectual power, all values are moral, and consistency is but a form of honor and courage. It marks singleness of purpose and the pressure of the total reality upon an earnest mind capable of recollection. The spirit of system, though it so often renders the mind fanatical and obdurately blind to some facts, is essentially an effort to give all facts their due, not to forget things once discovered and understood, and not to leave illusions and vices comfortably unchallenged. Certainly the total reality will elude any human system, but that is no reason why human nature, which is itself a system, should not exist and assert itself, and it cannot exist congenially without intellectual clearness or without translating its natural economy into a system of ideas. In the realm of essence, no such system can have any preeminence over any other. Each is the pattern of only one possible world, but it may be the full revelation which the existing world brings to one particular creature, and it may render valid for his description of things those dialectical bonds which are internal to it. Essences as Terms Names are normally given to things rather than to essences, and are then proper names. That is, they are indications like a gesture, designating a natural object without describing it. Although words like table and john may be names common to many natural objects, each of these objects is an existence containing much more than the fact that it is a table or is called john. Therefore, in giving the name table or john to that object when encountered, I do not mean to distinguish an essence, either intuited or intended, but to indicate a thing distinguished by its position relatively to me in the natural world, and by its general potentialities and connections there. I do not profess in so naming this object to exhaust its nature, but merely to point to an existence in a certain quarter with a casual, relative, and summary characterization of it. I should indeed not call this object table unless it were a piece of furniture of a certain height with a flat top, and I should not call the other object John unless it were a male inhabiting an English-speaking country 
but these conditions for applying those names are far from being the objects. The objects named are particular, natural, fluid, and indefinable. It is possible, however, to apply names to essences also as, for instance, to the triangle or to beauty, and then these names are inaptly called general. I say inaptly because they do not designate classes of things, but in designating an essence they leave open the question whether any or many things exist describable by that term. Names then designate not particulars but universals. The application of names or other signs to essences has an important consequence. It permits reasoning. Things have no dialectical relations, their very existence and fluidity being a defiance to dialectic. The unity of a thing is not perfect and definable, as if a thing were an essence hypostasized. It is a partial, dynamic, historical unity in that a thing remains traceable for a time in the flux of the world until, according to the conventional use of language, that particular thing is said to perish. Everything would be continually perishing, and nothing would endure for two moments. If a thing were the essence which for one moment it exemplifies, and everything might be everlasting were a thing the substance which is transmitted within the conventional boundaries of that thing from each of its moments to the next. A thing is a part of nature, a mode of substance, a parcel of matter that plays a certain part and wears a certain mask in the comedy of change, and only so long as it does so, then the same matter puts on a new mask and begins to speak in another voice. It has become another thing. Socrates is a part of the flux of nature, between limits fixed by the birth and death of one animal. Neither his aspect nor his thoughts at any one moment are Socrates, and the whole essence which his life embodies when taken as a whole is also not Socrates, but is only the truth of his life seen under the form of eternity. His opinions may have dialectical relations, but he and his actual faith in them cannot have them. Existence itself is absurd, external to the essence which it may illustrate, and irrelevant to it, for it drags that essence into some here and now, or some then and there, and the thing so created far from being identical with their essence at any moment, exist by eluding it, encrusting it in changing relations, and continually adopting a different essence, so that nothing accurate can be said of a thing supposed to bridge two moments of time. Yet, to bridge two moments, in some sense, is indispensable to existence. The essence of a process, if we turn to that, is also not that process in act. The actual process is an existence inwardly unstable. And all I have just said of momentary being applies to any stretch of existence. The span of any event is just as truly a moment as the minimum duration which human wit can conceive. Since history, science, and poetry are all in the same case, they arrest essences exclamatory visions, and apply them as names to the flux of nature, which they can neither fathom nor arrest. Dialectic, then, though itself a movement in thought, can weave together only eternal essences, and the pattern it thus designs is an eternal essence in its turn. In reasoning, attention passes and repasses between these fixed terms, and if by chance any of the terms were exchanged for another, the reasoning would be fallacious, becoming to that extent an irresponsible dream.
Now there is a psychological difficulty in reverting an intuition to exactly the same essence in a mind so volatile as the human. It is not to be expected that the entire complex essence present at one moment should ever be present again. The organ of thought being in flux, the terms of thought can hardly be repeated. The purposes of communication and reasoning would therefore not have been served by attempting to name and recall the entire actual burden of any moment. Only in dramatic and lyric poetry we approach any such effort at complete personal expression. You can hear, of course, success in reviving or communicating a moment of actual life is never more than approximate. Readers of poetry feel that the poet has been well inspired and that they have rekindled his very soul if any full, new, and vivid moment of intuition is begotten by his words in their own bosoms, and the more the inspiration is the readers and not the poets, the greater the poet is thought to be. The irony of fate in this may wound a man's vanity, who hopes to be immortal in his own person, and to impose his opinions or his loves on mankind forever. But humility and elevation of mind, which go together, will not take offense. The poets have had their own visions, the truth and beauty of which are hidden in God, and their works have been so closely knit into the instruments and traditions of human expression as to be fertile there in many a new pleasure and fresh thought. Reasonable minds will not ask for more. Whether the exact intuitions which they have reached can ever come to any other mortal is a question not even to be broached. For the function of poetry is not to convey information, not even to transmit the attitude of one mind to another, but rather to arouse in each a clearer and more poignant view of its own experience, belongings, and destiny. To this end, the elastic connotation of words with the intrinsic dignity of phrases, as in the English Bible, is a positive advantage in poetry. It enables the same symbol to quicken images in various minds according to their several capacities, stirring them to a true sincerity. Hence the musical, inspired, and untranslatable nature of poetry which lies more in the salt relief and cadence of the utterance, carrying with it a certain sensuous thrill and moral perspective than in definable meaning of the poet's words. In prose, on the contrary, words are primarily signs for some fact which they serve to record or announce. The sounds themselves and the other essences, emotional or pictorial, the sounds themselves and the other essences, emotional or pictorial, which in intuition convey such information, are passed over. They are mere instruments, the claw with which intent clutches the potent fact. Nor is the intrinsic essence of this fact that which in prose words profess to describe. It would be a vain speculation akin to poetry to consider what a stone or a sheep or an enemy may be in themselves. Such a question would invite not to action, but to self-forgetfulness and sympathy. A dissolving sympathy with dramatized things which is idle or even dangerous. I might soon find myself refusing to eat mutton, or going over to the enemy, or disproving the existence of stones. The tight mainspring of action and thought keeps me keeps me ticking without such scruples, or if they intervene, condemns them to futility. Prose, like perception, designates things only externally, things which, since they act and are acted upon, are substances. I have found that substances 
posited by animal faith are identified not by specifying their essence, but by indicating their place and function in that field of receding events called nature, of which any act is the center. The existence of nature is involved in the execution of any act, since this act is a link in a flux of events extending beyond it. At the same time, belief in nature is involved in the intent and eagerness which, in consciousness, express action, or readiness for action. Thus, the prophet of bestowing names on things and of speaking in prose, like the prophet of being sensible at all to external objects, does not lie in revealing the essence of these objects, but in expediting action amongst them. A whole network of appearance and language may accordingly remain a miracle of aesthetic and grammatical design spun in its own colors and suspended in the air without inconvenience or anomaly. If the connections meantime established between action and action are still quick and nicely adjusted, the whole rumble of the discoursing mind is music on the march and no sane man expects it to join in battle or to describe the enemy fairly. As music, however, may occasionally become an object of thought in itself, and may be elaborately described by the musician, so many things in essence which, in the apprehension of things, was only a symbol or an emotion, may be arrested in reflection, and receive a name. The name, with its valence, so to speak, or its atmosphere of suggestion now becomes the datum in actual intuition, and the essence which formerly occupied that place and was a symbol for some material fact now recedes into an object of intent and a theme for consecutive description. Speech and writing are a complication in nature. As they exist substantially, they are subtle secondary figures and rhythms impressed on matter which serve mankind to record or forecast those larger rhythms and figures called real things and true events, in which human existence is itself implicated. Thus language like sensation becomes significant by virtue of the animal faith which vivifies it, and this significance is its moral being. The same framework of spontaneous belief, readiness, memory, and expectation on which understanding of nature is stretched, stretches and projects also the force of words, making them indicative of absent and eventual objects. If the object is in essence, it nevertheless is identified only by being placed in some natural perspective, borrowed by language from the material world. An absent essence can be indicated only as the essence meant by a sign which is commonly a word, and the sense of this word can be revived and realized only by reverting in fancy to the natural environment in which it was first uttered. Thus, description in words or other signs is indispensable for making an essence an object of intent when it is no longer, or not yet, an object of intuition. The torments suffered by the souls in Dante's Inferno, for instance, are not intuited by the poet or the reader in their intended essence, for then he would be enduring those torments actually, yet he knows what he means by them, the words or images that suggest them are significant, and in proportion as they are well chosen, they converge upon the object, the unrealized essence of those torments, as they would be if actually felt. Such convergence, while it might render the description perfect in the language used, would not at all tend to reproduce the pains by bringing their essences into living intuition. On the contrary, it would be the essence of poetry that would actually fill the mind with verbal harmonies and sensuous vistas continually opening and closing. If there was any touch of repulsion or actual distress, it would be by a lapse from pure discourse, as when Dante becomes political or a childish reader takes alarm, fearing that the material world may contain the bodies and places where such torments occur, and that there is danger of deserving them. 
In meaning and essence, we accordingly by no means tend or wish to intuit it, but just as in the case of material objects of intent, we indicate its locus in the realm to which it intrinsically belongs. Here the realm of essence as there the realm of matter, without at all requiring to create in the realm of spirit an intuition of that object as it is in itself. It appears then that just as the whole world of common sense history and physics is posited, not experienced, so the whole world of dialectic, the labyrinth of essences studied in mathematics, logic, grammar, and morals is meant and not intended. Of course, to posit anything is itself an experience, and in meaning something, I must have some intuition of my terms and some feeling of intent. But the actual experience of knowing is not the object known, and the essence intuited in reasoning about essences is not those essences. For either the essence meant is a part only of the given field of intuition, or it is not given at all, but indicated by converging symbols as the object of an eventual, perhaps unattainable, intuition. Thus pi is an essence meant which can enter unequivocally into an equation, but it is not expressible in arithmetical figures, nor in any sensuous experience. Its nature is known by circumstantial definition. It is a goal of thought, the exact proportion between the circumference of a circle and its diameter. When I think of pi, this exact proportion is signified but not intuited. What is actually before our mind is the Greek letter, its sound, and a shooting vista into a world of words, human mathematics, breaking here and there into images of special circles, visual or given by gesture, a psychic sea through which intent can nevertheless easily steer towards the fixed but unattainable object defined as pi. Even when an essence is present, like the color of the sky, I must retreat a little and revert to it from a different intuition in order to identify or demean it. And this different intuition is commonly that of the word blue, the name of that color. It need not be this particular word. The Spanish word azul, in my case, would do just as well. The fact which shows how separate the intuition is in intending from the intuition in seeing, and how disparate, or possibly in taking in or apperceiving that evident blue and describing it, I may use as a point of vantage the visual memory of some material object, say the background of Titans, Bacchus, and Ariadne, thinking to myself, this blue is that blue, a wafted image referred to some natural object and the occasion and place where I encountered it. For London and youth hang for me about that picture. May thus take the place of verbal predicates to define an intended essence and keep it as an object of perpetual reference. Merely to prolong a present intuition will never turn the essence presented into a goal of intent or a term useful in discourse. Such a term must be kept constant in its absence, and must be often absent if it is to be always the same. Intended essences thus acquire through the machinery of identification, projection, and intent, a certain remoteness and mystery. They become concepts or ideals. Not that when they swim into intuition, if they ever do so, they are not perfectly individual and concrete. This blue which now floods the sky and my own being is the most obvious of realities and the nearest at hand. So in its essence is 
that blue which is now not here, but which I evoke sentimentally out of a remote context in the world of hearsay and of memory and which I identify with this blue, because this blue has awakened in me a state of feeling and a train of associations, ending in a revival of the circumstances of that lost intuition and, as I fondly assume, in recovery of that lost essence. This blue is still the only essence before me. That this blue was also there is an assertion not founded on a simultaneous inspection of the two objects, which is impossible, but on enveloping the given essence in the old atmosphere and calling it by an old name. This identification is hazarded. Thought and belief, even if to be verified, are shots in the air when they are actual, but irresponsible movement by which intent posits this object takes nothing away from the intrinsic reality of this object, be it a thing or an essence. I may, if I have the necessary indications, intend and refer to things in their absence without compromising them or reducing them to abstractions from my present beggarly self. Homer was better inspired in speaking of winged words than those philosophers who call words sounds or movements of the larynx. Material organs and material occasions are no doubt indispensable to the birth of language, to its evolution, and to its utility. So a flying arrow requires a bow and a target, and the material reed and feathers that are its substance. But discourse is flight, it is signification, and the more we scrutinize its actual being, the more unsubstantial, fugitive, and transitive its essence appears. Not only can it never alight or become anything but a flying intent, but even the hits it makes, not the count the misses, are achievements only conventionally. It dies on arrival, and can never know whether it has killed its bird. It is for the gamekeepers that follow in its wake to collect the bag. And how different is this dead booty of mundane routine and prosperity and plodding art from the gleaming flight, the intent aim, the miraculous shot of actual thinking. If any one in his speculative ambition is bent on seizing the veritable essence of substance, I hardly know what comfort can await him, but if his satisfaction was rather in the patterns and harmonies of essence, which he hoped to disentangle dialectically, he need not be disappointed. Because even if the terms of his demonstrative science are remote terms, always objects of intent and never of intuition, yet at this remove and in that shadowy precision they form an actual perspective, a present theme for the mind. Essences are omnipresent, and while attention remains awake, you cannot shut off one without presenting another, if the objects of intent remain remote, as the persons of a novel and their career remain imaginary, the discourse which is the seat of those intentions must always be actual, like the crowding words, images, and excitements loved by the authors and readers of novels. The medium is always immediate. The life of language, of poetry, of dialectic is a keen and an innocent life. It has, by virtue of its roots in the body and the control of its developments by circumstances, a quite sufficient relevance to material facts, a quite respectable value as a record and forecast of human destiny. Intrinsically, it has its own vital, expressive, aesthetic intensities. It is not an illusion unless it is turned into illusion by inexperience or a 
equivocation. Love, for instance, arising irrepressibly in each successive generation is a genuine revelation, not rebuked at all by the knowledge that it has often existed before towards other objects. If it involves illusions, they regard only ulterior facts, less important than itself. So the literary or mathematical or grammatical medium of discourse with all the logical and moral zeal which it involves is genuine life, full of intent and intuition. Why rebel against spirit and ask it to be something other than it is? The flight of the arrow, in spite of Zeno, is as true a fact as the ulterior positions between which it flies or the rest which it dreams of but excludes by flying. So the intrinsic essence of discourse is signification, a flight in which the wings are words or other signs, alone actually present, and the goal alone valued or considered is described simply as the point of the compass, perhaps receding and unattainable, towards which those wings are straining. It is in the act of traversing data in such a specific direction to which a living animal holds much more unswervingly than to the intuition of any datum. That names, which are cries, come to the lips as these cries are habitual and very limited in number compared with the cloud-like drift of intuitions. They serve to remark the goals of thought far more clearly and unambiguously than its actual being. So things are better defined in discourse than sensations, and intended essences better than essences given. Instances of Essence Since pure being is infinite and contains all essences, how can anything else be? In other words, what is there in existing things besides their essences? A legitimate question and admits of an answer. For if there were nothing but essences, and if pure being, because infinite, exhausted all possible modes of being, there would be no discourse, no ignorance, no knowledge, and consequently no questions. In the realm of essence, all equally is open, safe, and perspicacious. One essence cannot slyly entrench itself on a sort of egotistical eminence from which to survey, attack, or deny any other essence. Since this, nevertheless, is done in what we call life or existence, and since I am doing it at this moment in this inquiry, it is certain that pure being is not all being, and that in existence being is impure, having in it something more or something less than any essence. This is but another way of asserting that there is a world, that there are facts, and that there is a difference between truth and error. Such a thickening and self-contradiction by which essences become things may irritate the dialectician and may disturb the contemplative mind, but any attempt to deny the fact would be idle. The denial itself would reintroduce the very categories of existence, flux, self-transcendence, and truth which it professed to dismiss. Could a man really be sublimated into his essence, he would be silent, as pure being is silent. Let him who will, by all means, ascend into that blessedness, if he can. But he must leave philosophy to poor living mortals whose minds are perpescular and in whose impure world much is past, much is distant, and all is obscure. 
To pursue this subject would be to broach at once those realms of being which are not that of essence. Here I must leave the question of their precise nature in suspense. But I can hardly avoid some examination of the effect which they have on the manifestation of essence to the human mind. For making this manifestation possible, they intervene in it, mingling with it an urgency and obscurity which no essence can have of itself. Manifestation is an event, and although that which is manifested there can be only an essence, the occasion and the setting transpose it into a new plane of being, the plane of phenomena or of descriptions, and render it, as the Platonist said, other than itself. It is intrinsically and inalienably eternal, yet here are temporal instances of it. It is a universal, but it appears in particulars lending them such positive characters as they may have. It is perfectly unambiguous, and nevertheless it is merged and confused with other essences in the flux of things and of language. Realization of essence by an ironical fate is accordingly a sort of alienation from essence. We call it realization when from being perfectly real in its own fashion becomes an illusion in some mind, or the momentary form of some treacherous matter. Or perhaps we call it manifestation when that which manifests it, some existing thing or phase of discourse, distracts us from it, and scarcely suffers us to observe it for its own sake. There are various phrases capable of expressing the relation between essence and instances of it. Each phrase represents some perspective view of the same actual relation. We may call it participation in that every instant shares with the other instances the whole nature of the essence, but this term may lead to misunderstandings. If we infer that an essence has parts, one of which may fall to each instance, or that an essence is a class or collection of particulars. If we express the matter in a religious myth as the story of the fallen soul, instances may be said to remind us of a divine original, that essence in its purity. And then, in a cosmological myth, this original may be conceived as a magnet attracting matter, the matter is sensitive to that particular attraction, into a likeness of that essence, so that any existing instance of an essence might be called an imitation or copy of it. Such copies, if subsisting only in the mind, would be recollections. A less picturesque name for instances is phenomena, that is, manifestations of an essence. But these terms, for a modern, suggest a subjective seat for the instance, whereas, of course, many phenomena are manifestations of essences in matter, in other words, temporal things. A safer word for instances in general is accordingly exemplification. This covers both embodiment of essences in matter or in events, and revelation of essences in intuition. A synonym for Exemplification might be realization, but it has the disadvantage of suggesting that essences, when not exemplified, are not real, and that reality means existence. Whereas unexemplified essences are perfectly real in their own sphere, and many of those exemplified being only imagined do not exist in the sense of being the forms of any substance. The term Realization is convenient to express the passage from an incipient to a clear thought, or from an unfulfilled to a fulfilled perfection in things. In the former case, we may also say that the essence has been defined, and in the latter that it has been materialized. 
The great difference in all cases is that instances can occur only once, while essence may recur any number of times. That which is local in the occurrence is the instance. That which might be identical in various occurrences is the essence. If I write the same word twice, the word which is the same is the essence, and the words which are two are its instances. Instances are indeed occasions for deviation. They are crossroads at which two worlds meet. One set of relations exhibits the instance as an essence. Another set exhibits it as a fact. The idiosyncrasy of the essence there realized alone enables the fact to be distinguished from the rest of the natural medium in which it exists. If we were interested in true being, and the actual and moral quality of things it is accordingly that essence and its essential relations that would absorb all our attention. But we are animals swimming for dear life in the same flux in which this instance of essence has appeared. It is the moment of that medium. What will happen to us next, that preoccupies us, and therefore probably we neglect the intrinsic being of that occasion. And of all occasions, in our haste to trace one occasion out of another, the net of existence in which the instances of essence are caught even seems perhaps to our rude philosophy to create the fish which it catches. We deny their prior reality, their intrinsic being. They are to us only the contents of our net, and we shut our eyes as we swallow them. The matter of them may still nourish us, but our attention that extent has deviated from the intuition of essence, which is its only spiritual function, into tracing the labyrinth of fact. We have chosen the endless path leading from existence to existence, as indeed any instance of essence, since it must come before us on some natural occasion, invites us to do. As in translating a language, we must abandon it. So in recognizing an essence, we must half materialize it. In existence, in sense, and in thought, it has become impure. Its essential character now figures in a substance, a medium, or a context which are alien to it. This incarnation of essences in particulars must not be supposed either to alter the essences, which are all incorruptible, or to be an imperfect incarnation, so that a part of the divinity, so to speak, descends into the world and another part remains in heaven. Certainly, in any assignable world or portion of a world, only an individual essence can be realized, but of that essence, the realization there will be perfect. The infinity of pure being renders it inevitable that whatsoever form an existence may happen to assume, that form will be some precise essence eternally self-defined. For however fast the world may change or however confused chaos may become, Events can never overtake or cover the infinite advance which pure being has had on existence from all eternity. And whichever of those prefigured forms a thing may choose to realize, that form it must realize perfectly. As an aerolith, if it falls to the earth at all, must strike some pre-existing spot on its surface. So too in the history of existence, as it picks up and drops these multitudinous characters, there is also no ambiguity. Substance in the act of taking on and shuffling these forms merely connects them in a voluminous flux alien to their several qualities. The dance falls into figures and generates relations which each essence taken individually did not contain or imply. And if further facts arise out of this movement as spirit arises in animals, the characters and complexion of these hyperphysical existences are also just what they are. Feelings and discourse take on such color or intent as they have without dislocating in the least the order of nature which they enrich. The pearls may be inwardly more precious and opalescent than the thread on which they are strung, or they may seem superfluous and negligible to a science or action so economical as to trace the thread only. But whether prized or ignored, 
The pearls shine by their own light in their assigned places quite unequivocally. In a word, there is no ambiguity in the truth. It enshrines all the facts, no matter how complex, with their exact configuration. Inexactitude, approximation, imperfection are not possible in the relations of things to their essences. Each thing at each moment is just what it is. It is transformed as it is transformed, related as it is related. And the sum of these changes and of these infinite cross lights is just what it is under the eye of eternity. Nevertheless, from the moral point of view, imperfect realization is not a meaningless phrase. Imagination, language, and interest are finite. The categories of human discourse though somewhat variable, are constitutional and limited. They need to be so in order to fulfill their cognitive and imaginative function, since knowledge is an adaptation of fancy to practice. A rational eloquence, not a reduplication of things as they were before life or imagination arose among them. Every name and every desire, accordingly, suggests an essence to the psyche which may fail to be realized in the world, or may be realized there only approximately. The fact that another somewhat different essence is realized there leaves human attention cold. It asks for bread and receives a stone, and to point out that the stone was a perfect stone, would seem sheer mockery. The disharmony between the psyche and the rest of nature runs even deeper, for the essence actually realized in the facts may be not merely unwelcome or uninteresting, it may be nameless altogether and inconceivable. Every name and every concept which bewildered man will impose on those facts will then fit them imperfectly, and being without intuition of their true essence, he will call them vague facts, formless, elusive, or defective. For his senses have their stock responses like birds of one note or of very few, so too the passions and the theories of which his imagination is capable. His discourse moves within a private museum of ideal and general natures. The few essences distinguished by language, and it is only in his finer or his idle moments, if he has them, that he looks between the meshes of that logical net and catches unauthorized glimpses of the flux of things with all its irrelevant marvels. Essences, then, may be said to be manifested imperfectly, when they are not the essences of things, but are prescribed for them by those senses and passions of some egotistical animal whose mind is like a stomach limited in its powers of digestion and obliged to treat all foreign substances as approximations. How questionable and half-baked to its ideal victuals. If, then, it is possible to assign to anything an essence which is not its essence, this possibility arises because the essences first and normally manifested in feeling and thought are not the essences that have been embodied multitudinously and successively in things since the beginning of the world, and that now define their dynamic nature. Yet merely this disparity between ideas and things would be no anomaly, because ideas are not things but ideas, and ideas like words may be excellent signs for events in the field of action without in the least resembling them, if only the mechanism which controls these ideas does not precipitate any assertion, expectation, or attitude which events within or without the psyche do not justify. The justification required is not that the essence given in discourse should repeat the essence embodied in material events. The repetition, which is unlikely, 
superfluous and incongruous with the summary function of sensation, as well as the significant or poetic thought for in naming, reporting, or prefiguring events. Discourse will necessarily add an intellectual syntax, a moral perspective, and a mocking humor which are not in them. What is required is such a vital harmony between the life of thought and that of things as may render discourse appropriate and adorning. But often, and here's the rub, maladaptation exists in their respective movement and rates of change between a psyche and her environment so that the essences revealed imaginatively to that psyche are late or early or out of key with the march of events, not only outside, but in the residual parts of her own life. Then, in her assertiveness, since she is engaged in action, she will impose on things that which she adds and deny that which she leaves out, and this Hypostasis of her fancies or of her ignorance will become unfathomable error about the facts encountered by her in action and prompting her to this fond discourse. Thus, discourse, while manifesting perfectly at each moment certain specious essences to the spirit and embodying perfectly the essence of spirit itself, may involve confusion regarding the objects which it intends to describe as well as ignorance of its own basis, nature, and history. In the study of nature, philosophers are much influenced by the love of economy. They wish on this subject to have as few ideas as possible. They may even hope to be monists and to have only one. This idea of simplicity is imposed on nature by the mind in its desire to be clear, comprehensive, and curt. It is an extension of the dogmatic impulse involved in action by which the most conspicuous essence given in sense is taken for the essence of the object encountered. The philosopher merely repeats this form of judgment when he assumes that the simplest theory which his wit can frame must be the essence of the universe. In the study of essence, the ruling interest being more contemplative, he may perhaps avoid this haste. Illusions are no less truly essences than truths are, and no confusion will arise from complications or diversities in essences if only we abstain from asserting them of the same substances. Now, I believe that more essences and of more kinds are exemplified in nature than the student of nature is inclined to notice. They are not realized only in single file or on one plane of being, and they are not all predictable of the same substance, nor all predictable of anything. There are many open to our inspection, which are not descriptive of material things even indirectly, and on the other hand, they are presumably embodied in matter, and on the other hand, there are presumably embodied in matter many essences of many kinds which it has not entered into the heart of man to conceive. Such considerations are not useless in stating, if not in solving, the problems of natural philosophy. But for the moment I must be satisfied with the word about the essences which must be exemplified, some in one way, others in another, in order that discourse may move at all, and ideas may describe or fail to describe their intended objects. The character of the particular world in which we find ourselves has been richly and ignorantly reported in the poetry and science of all ages. It is not for me, in passing, to revise those reports. There is avowedly a great inorganic cosmos astronomical, geographical, chemical, and on earth 
at least there are living organisms capable of adjusting themselves progressively to their environment and of modifying that environment for their future convenience. The essence of human life thus runs over and engages parts of the outer world in its rhythms. And what we call the arts, and this seems a miraculous subjugation of matter by mind. If we look closer, the rhythm of mind seems itself to be but an extension of that matter. Organisms in their reproduction pass through the most curious seminal and embryonic phases in which nothing human appears. Essences seem to descend on things like doves out of the blue, but they have their periods, conditions, and fatal exits. They compose the forms of organic behavior or enacted intelligence observable in the world. Enacted intelligence, observable sensibility, discoverable languages and works of art, though they are understood to express feeling, contain no feeling in their recognizable structure. All the essences which they can possibly embody, however subtle, prolonged, or interwoven, are essences embodied in matter. There are complexities in the one flux of events in space and time which is called nature. They are all open to scientific discovery and measure, being intrinsically dated, localized, and traceable in their genius and effects within the material sphere. I have mentioned feeling supposed to be expressed in some of these observable facts, and although I have not mentioned it, there is implied throughout a transcendental observer a spirit to whom these essences are evident, who takes note of their embodiment, position, and physical interrelation. The natural philosopher may well protest that no feeling and no spirit is discernible in the field of his observation, and how should they be discernible there, when that is not their place nor their mode of being? Nevertheless, he is reckoning without his host and forgetting his own existence insofar as all that he recognizes, including his own body, is from time to time focused and actually present to him in the light of spirit, a fact patent to reflection and recorded perpetually in any honest confession or bit of autobiography, such as human discourse and conversation are chiefly composed of. Remove this pedestal and the whole conception of nature has nothing to stand on, no means of entering into the moral world, no claim upon the living philosopher. He is a discoursing spirit by nature and a discoverer of this world only by accident, and that this world forces itself at present on his attention and belief, until, therefore, he finds a means of integrating somehow his spiritual being within the realm of matter. There can be no solidity in his doctrine for all knowledge of the world when he is collected and self-conscious will seem to him mere babble. At the same time, he will marvel and even tremble at the incredible tenuity of his actual being. He has but to shut his eyes for all that painted world to vanish. He has but to arrest the inner rumble of words for his memory and life to become a forgotten story. He has but to fall asleep for the lever of reason to lose its fulcrum altogether and the whole argument to lapse. We may insist that his extinction makes no difference to the realm of essence and a little difference to the universe. But this very fact, since this extinction makes all the difference to him, establishes the ineradicable diversity between his spirit on the one hand and the universe with the realm of essence on the other. There is, in fact, another way altogether, besides embodiment and matter by which essences may be exemplified, they may be imagined. Even those which are embodied passively or formally in things, if any one is ever to see or to attribute them, must also, perhaps at quite a different time, be imagined, felt, conceived, 
contemplated or somehow directly revealed to spirit this presence of essences occasionally to imagination was very accurately called by the scholastics their objective being contrasted with the intrinsic or logical being which they had in themselves and with the formal embodiment which they might have in things but in the utter confusion of modern philosophy substances being denied in one breath and imagination in the next the objective has come to mean that which is independent of intent or attention fixed upon it which is precisely what the objective can never be it is indeed the intuition of essences in their own category when the things that may embody them are absent or non-existent that makes up the essence of spirit in its various forms of feeling sense thought memory or knowledge spirit is the actuality of the unsubstantial it belongs to the nature of spirit to be cognitive for even when intuition is pure unmixed with intent so that there is no claim to transitive knowledge no positing of facts intuition must reveal an object other than its own spiritual being and activity the intrinsic action of spirit like that of existence of which spirit is a special instance cannot be itself an object of intuition it can be exemplified only by being enacted and realized by a transition in neither term of which it could be realized separately if spirit were ever suspended if it ceased to live to drink in and to peruse its object it would have literally lost itself in that object there would be no spirit no intuition any longer but only some essence and this essence for its part would no longer have any adventitious prominence in the realm of essence no emphasis or actuality would fall upon it and no instance of it would have occurred it is the act of attention synthesis and apprehension performed by the psyche animating some animal that lends to any essence its objective actuality or ideal presence and in so doing and inseparably the same act embodies and exemplifies the essence of spirit in a particular instance there are accordingly two disparate essences exemplified in every instance of spirit one is the essence of spirit exemplified formally and embodied in the event or fact that at such a moment such an animal has such a feeling the other is the essence then revealed to that animal and realized objectively or imaginatively in his intuition the character of this given essence serves to distinguish morally this phase of spirit from other possible phases any essence whatever if the psyche at work has the requisite energy and scope may appear in intuition even the essences of existence and of spirit may be defined in reflection as i have been endeavoring to define them here but nothing follows as to the truth or relevance to existence of any such visionary term if these essences are embodied in nature it is because nature of her own will embodies them in their natural places not because i here and at this remove to find them in my thought they are by no means embodied formally in the thought that conceives them so as to be predictable of this thought my idea of god is not god and does not bring god into existence on its precise model nor does my idea of matter perform a corresponding miracle my ideas merely take their places among ideas as being images or hypotheses of a certain quality which anyone else if he can and will is at liberty to conceive also 
It is the occasions on which they arise. There are several organs in nature that will distinguish their instances historically, as well as bring them into existence. Thus, my thoughts in this book are distinguished physically as events in the world by belonging to my person and buzzing in my brain at the dates and places where I rehearse them. But the same thoughts as essences then conceived by me are distinguished morally by their scope and subject matter, eternal essences having eternal relations of contrast or affinity with the other essences which employ my thoughts or those of other philosophers, and beyond that to all other essences that might be instead the theme of any discourse. This diversity of status between an essence embodied and the same essence conceived remains complete even when in its two disparate instances the essence is identical, but this is not normally the case. The essences embodied even in the human body and total human career are not such as human imagination can easily conceive. And the essences embodied in the depths and unattainable dimensions of nature escape us altogether. On the other hand, the aesthetic and sentimental essences which fill human discourse are often, by their very nature, incapable of passive embodiment. They cannot be true, save in the historical sense that it may be true that someone has entertained them. So, for instance, any quality or intensity of pain, such as an essence, can be exemplified only spiritually, never materially. Its instances must be feelings. No cataclysm of nature, however disruptive, can ever embody evil. Evil can be realized there only if, in virtue of a previous organic harmony, a spirit was there incarnate in which the disruption could generate the intuition of a hated change. The causes of the belief in substance common among mankind do not coincide altogether with the reasons that might justify it. The quantitative and local continuity in things is indeed obvious to primitive man in what he manufactures, but it eludes him in all else. For whence, he will ask, the matter that forms the clouds or the dreams of the night. Attentive physics and speculative physiology are requisite to show us that the basis of these things also is a continuous redistribution of matter. Consequently, the notions of substance that have prevailed in philosophy. The right one having established itself only in practical life and in the arts have been generally inapt. Sometimes substance has been placed in pure being, sometimes in platonic ideas, sometimes in the laws of nature, and always in something metaphysical that is in a kind of existence or fatality other than that of discoverable nature, things. It was not a substance to be found within obvious objects and gradually to be brought to light by a closer examination of them. It was rather a different substance supplied by logic or by dramatic analogy. Something imagined to exist behind things and, so to speak, in their steed. So, notably, the mystical notion of pure being, an abyss, simple and single, into which things sink and out of which they come. This is a most poetic phantom and as such profoundly significant. For all natural objects of experience and love being contingent exist miraculously momentarily and for the heart deceptively only. Yet, says the poet, that night which swallows them up cannot be mere nothingness, since it continually yields them up again, or objects like them. This Cronus that devours his children, this limbo of infinite but neutral potentiality, 
may thus be felt to have a most intensive reality. It is called the substance of all things, being a sort of fertile death pregnant with them all, yet changeless and one, since in its bosom they are not divided. This mystic substance, however, is something visionary. It is a negative afterimage of the flux of natural things, in which their differences are blurred and their energies added together. It would be incapable of exercising any of the functions of a true substance. I will not repeat the sophism of Hegel that pure being is pure nothing. The essence of being is meant is an essence as positive and particular as any other. It may even be an object of intuition by itself, as many mystics know, and doubtless many animals. And far from being identical with the essence of nothing, it is the very opposite of it. But pure being, by definition, is without change, parts, or articulation. It can therefore offer no ground for any particular event sought in some other particular existence or group of existences, not in a mystic substance. And if no continuous quantitative substance has been discovered running through events and by its movement determining theirs, it will be necessary not to refer these events to any ground at all and to make a substance of each of them as is done in empirical idealism, or else, somewhat verbally, to refer them to the general system or order which they constitute, as is done in idealism of the absolute or cosmic sort. But in this last, we should pass to the modern notion that substance is a schema or law, of which more presently. Closely allied to the absolute substance of the mystics is the god of monotheism. When free and speculative theologians explain his nature in Hebraic tradition and in the faith of the people, God is a particular spirit living through time, renewing his thoughts on occasion and watching the spontaneous operations of nature and of the human mind, so that the latter, at least, may be sometimes displeasing to him. He is, however, an invincible magician, and as the world arose at his command and can be extinguished at his nod, he is certainly the cause, if not the substance of its being. Such a god, however, would find an experimental world in his own person, and the question about substance would recur in respect to the movement of his thoughts, will, and actions. Theology, however, has eluded the thorny problems that would thus arise by attributing immutability to the thoughts, will, and actions of God, to which these names, therefore, can only be applied figuratively. He is to be conceived as an eternal mind to which all essence and the whole course of existence are present at once. The divine idea of the universe and the divine judgment that it is very good, which is what the divine will would amount to, I suppose, so species eternitas, might then be called the substance of things in the transcendental sense, or even in the Platonic sense. The divine idea and will were but imperfectly fulfilled in existence. Matter, which may perfectly well be admitted into this system, would have been created by God and set in motion at the beginning of the world to be, in the scientific sense, the substance of nature. This theological system would be consistent and clear if theologians could only stick to it. But many of them, and those the most inspired, are haunted by the mystic notion of substance as well. Their God must be an unutterable abyss of being and perfectly simple, in which case, of course, the moving world has no relation to him, and in an inexplicable accident and a scandal, 
dollars than our reality. Others mystical and more plastic than platonic fashion think of God rather as the ultimate goal of the universe or as the moral order which ought to embody, or more particularly as the focus of their personal aspiration, as the perfect beloved of their dreams. But as happened to the pagan Platonists also, they easily slip from this moral religion into the blank mysticism that worships the unutterable abyss of pure being. For if personal aspirations, what ought to be and the goal of the universe were honestly consulted and expressed in the concrete, they would be found to lie in the opposite pole from substance, namely in civilization or the life of reason. Namely in civilization or the life of reason, a diversified, profane, natural, artful, and even amusing play of experience. To escape such an issue, which to the mystic would seem frivolous and distressful, the idea of natural life must be suppressed and in its place a very special and quite decadent passion. The love of the absolute must be allowed to legislate in morals, and then indeed the good of substance would come to have some affinity to each other, or even to be identical. If we define substance as self-existing, persistent, term, and change, we see at once that the first property can hardly fail to be assigned to something or other. If there is existence at all, something has to be self-existing in the end, if only my present thought. But persistency and continuity are more problematical attributes. To posit them comes in practice to positing yet another attribute of substance, the one most offensive to skeptics, that of being a cult on occasion. This most suspected quality, however, is the most conspicuous in metaphysical substitutes for matter. There are two such worthy of special mention. I do not mean historically, for I am not attempting a history of the subject, but because each in its way discloses a hidden, unsuspected reality behind nature, more permanent and intelligible than the flux of immediate appearance. These appearances, according to one view, are instances of a type. According to the other, they are realization of a law. The latter is a notion on which modern philosophy prides itself, thinking that platonic ideas and material substance are alike exploded, and when we have discounted the illusion and frivolity of such a boast, there remains the fact that laws are permanent molds of change and that, like platonic ideas, permanent molds of existence. They help us to classify and mentally to appropriate the flux of nature. If we admit evolution, laws seem more permanent than types and more intimately woven into the texture of the world. They are not perhaps quite everlasting. The range of time we survey the prehistoric past and all the future being conceived only by assuming the permanence of laws and being therefore incapable of corroborating them is but an instant compared with eternity. All well-attested laws, that of gravity for instance, might be special case or cases of others not yet clearly discerned such as those of electric atoms. Nor is it, of course, a safe assumption that the possible variations in natural laws would in turn be found to express some law of variation in laws. The total aspect of evolution might present no consecutive method at all, but some meandering and inconsequent contingency. There might be a sort of chaos in time, if not in space, in nature, like a living language, might gradually change its grammar and become unintelligible in its own house. The notion of types or platonic ideas being the reality behind things is not now prevalent in physics and never should have been so. It is an interpretation of discourse, not of nature. It belongs to moral philosophy, not to natural science, since it clarifies the goals and meanings of human life but never discloses the causes or but never discloses the causes or origin of anything. Displaced and treated as natural powers, 
platonic ideas at once turn into metaphysical substances. They are undiscoverable and incongruous with material things, the real substance of which is simply what is to be found inside of them. Nevertheless, in discourse, in art, and in morals, the Platonic method is and must remain the sole method of reason. They are the essences, fixed by intent or hinted at by growth and inspiration, in which the spirit might find its congenial objects in the counters of its game. They are not substances behind things, nor fixed patterns in nature, nor forces, nor prescribed forms, outside which it would be deformity to fall. They are essences above things to which things have chosen to aspire, or ideals with which we have chosen to compare them. The same originality of spirit appears in the normal perspectives of memory and history, even when, conventionally speaking, they are true enough. My knowledge of Julius Caesar obviously differs in date from its object, but it differs from it avowedly also in essence, since I cannot pretend to know the whole truth of Julius Caesar, nor any part of it with complete accuracy. The most scrupulous and exhaustive historian would be satisfied with recovering a few salient particulars, revivifying these in his own fancy, that of a modern, and surrounding them with comparisons, judgments, and emotions adventitious to his inner being of Julius Caesar and of his age. History is a poetic art, the muse, Cleo, must inspire it, and the existing correlate or controlling cause of the historian's thoughts, even when they are true, is not the object described. Caesar, but the historian's person, his documents, studies, passions, and abilities. Mind, accordingly, comes to enrich the essence of the world, not to reproduce it. Condensation, expression, comparison are also enrichments. It is not so much by repeating some literal aspect of something remote that this remote thing can be called to mind, as rather by modifying the present in deference and with reference to it. For instance, by giving it a new name or a new tragic or pictorial embodiment. The living poet and his contemporary world in evoking this new essence grow sensitive to that remote object and truly intend salute and describe it. This they may do because description no less than this they may do because description no less than intent or homage are relative. The attitude and contribution of the observer are integral to it. Material, even if subtle, influences descending from that object have stimulated him to this fresh conception, and the conception will be just and true insofar as, in the language native to this later and living world, it expresses that influence adequately in its present ramifications. For new statements about a thing may be perfectly true if they are made from new points of comparison. Thought is normally relative, expressing relations that accrue with time. It may occasionally include a rapt imaginative reproduction of something distant, though hardly to a great extent or to much purpose. Reproduction, again, is not the normal relation between essences embodied in matter and those revealed to spirit. Where this relation seems to obtain, as between an architect's first idea and the building that afterwards realizes it, the echo or fulfillment really belongs to the same realm, imagination, as the original conception. That which resembles the visionary project and repeats it is not the material house, which is a mass of whirling atoms or invisible energy or something no less recondite, but simply the aspect which this house presents to the architect's own eye or to that of a man like him. 
In registering such similarities between images, he has not issued from the realm of spirit. So the reputed likeness of images discoverable in the retina or in a photographic plate two segments of the originals in nature is a likeness between the essence revealed to a living spirit on one occasion and that revealed to it on another. There is no probable or discoverable likeness between the material composition of an eye of a countryside and of a sensitized plate. A living psyche must react upon these diverse substances before the actual vision arises in any of the three cases. But three so dissimilar substances should be able to occasion a similar image only proves that relatively to the organ of sense affected they serve the same purpose and offer an equivalent stimulus. As a gramophone, although materially so unlike a band of rapturous and sweating musicians, may serve the same purpose to the ear and may offer, up to a certain point, an equivalent stimulus. Shall we say that the exemplifications of essence in nature and in thought, although composed of very unlike forms, yet flow in parallel streams? If by parallel we understand simply not intermingled, I should answer, yes, but if by parallel we understand running side by side all the way and corresponding throughout, I should say, no, for it is contrary to the nature of spirit to arise in dead or in organic things, and where it arises its vistas radiate from that point according to the material tensions present in it forward and back along the stream of material events, and tangentially into all sorts of supervening images and rhymes. Spirit is what is called epiphenomenal. Although this word is very ill-chosen, since neither substance nor spirit is phenomenal, but the essences in body and matter and those revealed to intuition are indeed deployed in two different media. The spiritual perspective being at each point dependent for its existence and its character upon the balance and movement of the vital process beneath. But these spiritual perspectives are called forth only occasionally as matter rolls on, and they open out at right angles to any distance into the realms of truth and of essence. There are not, then, two parallel streams, but rather one stream which, in slipping over certain rocks or dropping into certain pools, begins to babble a wanton music, not thereby losing any part of its substance or changing its course, but unawares enriching the world with a new beauty. Feeling, intuition, prophetic and synthetic intelligence are spiritual facts utterly alien to the pedestrian flux of the materially successive. They too are transitory, subsisting only so long as the material fossi in which they are collected remain in being. F-O-C-I. But spirit though the occasions on which it arises are material, is itself an imponderable and invisible fact. And although its interests are borrowed from the impulses and contacts of animal life, the terms in which it expresses those interests are original and poetic. And by translating nature into those terms, it paints, as it were, a immortal portrait. Which of the essences conceived by the human mind, if any, may be credited with being the absolute and intrinsic essences of the natural world it is a question to be left to the judgment and modesty of natural philosophers. I may say something about it on another occasion, and so far as the matter interests a moralist or can fall within his competence. Here I will only note that while such coincidence is possible, all essences whatsoever being open to potential intuition every presumption is against it. Nature, if nature exists at all, is not a hypostasis of essences defined in human discourse. She is the matrix, incalculably ancient and vast, of human nature and human ideas, ideas which by their origin and their function express the sensibility and reactions to the human organism, and nothing else. 
To suppose that these ideas reproduce and literally define the intrinsic essence of nature is accordingly an illusion. Excusable because inevitable in an animal at once active and ignorant, yet such when maintained doggedly as to excite inextinguishable laughter in the immortal gods. But let us suppose that by a singular miracle human experience were clairvoyant and assigned to all parts of nature, in so far as they were encountered materially, their intrinsic essences. It would follow that whenever the mind conceived them, the essences of things would be exemplified twice over, once formally in the flux of matter and again imaginatively in that of mind. The stream of existence would bifurcate, and the two currents strangely diverse in substance, but strangely similar in form, would flow side by side, mirroring one another. For if it were found impossible, as it would be, to regard all given essences as embodied in natural things, first illusions, then secondary qualities, and finally primary qualities, would have to be interjected and sucked into the mental sphere. The natural world would have become all non-entity, and the result would be idealism. All this confusion comes of originally supposing that things are graphically copied in sense and nature in science, a belief founded on the projection of the essences given to spirit as if the world had been created and were now deployed on the model of human ideas. But the essences given to spirit are forms of imagination and thought. They never were and never will be the essences of things. And it is only by poetic license and conventional symbolism that we are compelled to clothe things in the garb of our sensations and rhetoric. Introjection is therefore only the counterpart of a false earlier projection and bifurcation the inevitable consequence of a pictorial physics. Nature, let me repeat, is not a visual image hyperstasized. She has embodied from indefinite past time whatever essences she has embodied without asking our leave or conforming beforehand, as philosophers seem to expect, to the economy and logic of our thoughts. These thoughts and images of ours, with their economy, are not irrelevant to nature, since she produces them at stated junctures. Our imagination and logic, as far as they go, are her own logic and imagination, by which here, at least, she finds it possible to possess and to celebrate herself spiritually. They are therefore true enough, and a different logic or a different imagination would probably be no truer. They have the value of signs and are felt to have it because the spirit which evokes them is incarnate, with transitive and not contemplative interests predominant in it, so that it takes all its visions when it can for omens of collateral powers. By the birth of spirit, nature is certainly complicated and rendered heteroclite, as animal life is later by the birth of language. But spirit can never contain any portion, not to say the whole, of the material flux that generates it. This new form of existence is immaterial, synthetic, cognitive, emotional, and of any of the feelings or intuitions which compose it, when they contain a vista, contain it spiritually only, focused and seen, not enacted piecemeal and irrecoverably self-substitutive, as an actual flux must be. For the fountain of conception is internal, it is the heart, and its deliverances, being fundamentally exclamatory, pictorial, and intellectually creative, can be brought round only poetically to describe the found dynamic structure and order of things.